Welcome to this video lecture on systemic ideation, an approach to generate innovative ideas systematically and consistently. My name is Jan Recker. I'm a professor at the University of Cologne. What I want to talk about today is one stage in the overall process of innovation. That is the process that organizations go through as they develop new ideas, incubate them, implement and operate them with a view to create new value. We are interested in this video only in the first stage ideation. So the generation, the coming up with new innovative ideas. The rest of the process is explained elsewhere and you can look up a reading on this overall process in the link below. In ideation, the objective is to generate new ideas for creating value. No idea is too crazy, and the more ideas we can generate at this stage, the better. I want to begin with a story that illustrates theory about ideation, namely the search for problem and solution pairs. The story is about Mr. Sato, who is now well beyond 85, who in 1970 developed um, luggage with wheels, which we all come to know, and probably all of you have one of these at homes. Um, now, the story goes that he was not an inventor, he was not working in the travel industry or in the suitcase industry, for that matter. Rather, he was lugging two heavy suitcases through an airport, airport uh, on the trip home from a vacation, and he noticed workers rolling a heavy machine on a wheeled skid. You know, these are the transport platforms with wheels under them. And he recalls that that was a solution that he would need for an entirely different problem, which is lugging heavy suitcases through an airport. So back at home, he took casters of the wardrobe trunk and mounted them on a big travel suitcase and voila, the suitcase had wheels. So what this story illustrates is that the search in innovation for problems for uh, for solutions for problems doesn't necessarily have to start with a problem it could start with a solution so in his case he saw a solution for an entirely different problem namely how to um, transport heavy machinery and he matched that to a problem that he was experienced namely how do i get my suitcase to my car yeah so what this illustrates is that innovation and the ideation of new innovation ideas isn't necessarily a problem solving activity, which is what most people think. So typically in problem solving, we formulate a problem and then search for a solution to that problem. Yeah. So in a way, in this thinking, a problem is a constant, as a constraint, as a problem that we're, we're having. And then we, we, we search a space of possible solutions to find the best ones. Now in ideation, as in the story, a better way to look at it is to see problem solution pair discovery where both the problem and the solution are variables, not constants. So that means we could look for solutions without a problem. We can look for problems without a solution. Um, and we can basically treat each one of these two elements of the pair the best way we can. So what the implications are is that we don't necessarily have to spend time or costs on formulating and specifying what exactly the problem is. It also means that if we do not find a solution, maybe we need to change the problem. Yeah. And third, whenever you have a given problem, you're searching for solutions, you are invariably, inevitably constrained in your thinking and in your search because you're looking for a particular solution to a particular problem. So this idea of treating both problem and solutions as two elements of a pair that we want to discover, which means that we may want to start with a problem and then find a solution. We might want to start with a solution and find a problem, or we try to discover both at the same time. This is the key idea behind approaching ideation systematically. So I'm going to show you a a framework now that is also available as a reading and the reference is given below um, that plays with these different approaches to finding innovation ideas to treating either the problem or the solution or the pair differently. So we can differentiate four thinking styles um, to approach ideation. One is we enhance current practices. 
Here we can think in patterns and find and have a look at our current practices, find a problem with these practices, and then systematically through pattern-based search, find solutions for these problems. A very different idea is deriving better practices. Here, the idea is that we do not look at our own practices at the moment, but at someone else's practices, maybe from a different organization, maybe in a different sector, in a different country, wherever. And we find solutions that work for them, and we try to match that solution to a problem we're having with our own practices. So we're effectively trying to learn from others. Utilizing potential practices means that we look into what are called hidden assets. So capabilities, people, resources, and other types of assets that we have available or at our disposal, but we're not utilizing at the moment, not utilizing fully. And by finding new solutions, building on these assets, we can find hidden solutions to either current or future problems that we may not even be aware of. Finally, designing new practices is an approach where we really treat problem and solution simultaneously as a pair. So we're designing new solutions for new problems at the same time. Now, these four different ways, they can all be um, separated alongside a number of dimensions. For example, by differentiating what you need to be able to do this uh, and where you operate, where you innovate. So what the outcome of these different thinking styles are. For example, in enhancement, what we need to do is understand ourselves. We need to understand what our current practices are, find a problem within, and then find a solution for them through um, pattern-based thinking. And then usually where we innovate are in operational assets and procedures. Deriving means that what we need to do, we need to learn from others. So we don't look at what we're doing. We don't understand ourselves. We try to understand what others are doing. And again, we're tr usually trying to innovate assets and procedures, but maybe a little bit more into strategic assets and capabilities. Utilization is again about ourselves. We need to understand ourselves, not our practices, but our potential practices, our assets, our hidden capabilities, skills, people, and resources that we're not utilizing to a maximum extent. And then we build new assets, new capabilities, new strategic potential practices that might be able to work as a solution for problems we didn't even know we have. Finally, design is a practice where we don't need to necessarily understand ourselves or learn from others. Instead, we're looking for experience. So we're doing something completely different here, and we can create new practice, either operational or strategic. Now, I will illustrate all these four different procedures to you, and I'm going to use a little case study as an illustration. And that is an experience that you may have experienced yourself, which is the visitor experience of the Empire State Building in New York, uh, one of the tallest buildings there. Um, and it has a particular value model behind it uh, that is uh, as a major tourist attraction. I think it's the biggest tourist attraction in New York, or certainly one of the biggest ones, several million visitors every year. Um, and our imagined task is that we want to find ideas to innovate this experience. And I want you to, when I go through this illustration, I want you to always think about, all right, what are problem solution pairs in this example? What are problems? What are solutions? What are pairs of these? Um, and just to get us started, so we are on the same page, let me give you a brief illustration of what the, you know, the classical value chain model is, at least the last time that I was up there, which was actually in 2007, I believe. And at that time, this is how the, the experience went. So at that time in New York, you had to go to one of these tourist uh, ticket kiosks. So a counter where you could buy tickets to tourist attractions. Usually you would find them because they look like a kiosk with a big queue in front of them. So we're waiting to buy a ticket. We need to pay for the ticket. And then whenever we actually want to go to the Empire State Building, we go to the Empire State Building and we see a queue building up on the outside waiting to get in. So we wait again to get in and get to the elevator. You have to go through a little security clearance. Um, you hop into the elevator and it takes you up um, to the top floor. On the top floor, you can go step outside. You're in this huge balcony overlooking um, Central Park and the rest of New York. You can enjoy the view. You can take pictures. You can propose to your girlfriend, whatever it is that you want to do. And at some stage, we go back to the elevator. We'll leave. 
that is the value chain model. So the the model about what that experience is, about what the um, the the value of the tourist attraction is to users. Now, what I want to do is now I want to go through the different thinking styles and show you how could you, you could ideate about innovations in this model for these tourist attractions. And we're going to start with enhancing current practices. The idea of the enhancement strategy is that we look inward. So we look at what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're currently doing. So we're focusing on our current practices in this value model. And what we do is we have a set of patterns that delineate change options and we can step through all the patterns and identify possible changes that would, we could apply to these current practices to make them better. You know, this is not a new strategy. This is a very well-known strategy. It's the essence of approaches that you may have heard of from lean management, process reengineering, Six Sigma, total quality management. They effectively became popular in the 60s and 70s through sto uh, stories, especially from Japan, from Toyota, or later in the 80s from Motorola and GE, General Electrics, all of which implemented such a methodology under different names, of course, and, and, and constantly reflected upon the current practices and looked at change options in a fairly systematic way, little by little, every day to innovate a little bit in peace. And over time, as the story goes, you get very big uh, innovations and change through very small steps. Now, the, the systematic way here is that there's only so many change options that you can do to a particular set of practices. For example, if you think about what the payment of a ticket to the Empire State Building is, or what the entire value chain is, it has a sequence of steps uh, in this practice, and there's only so many things we can change. So what we do is we can apply systematically a list of change patterns, and you can see them here on the right-hand side. There are about 15 or so. There could be 10, you can probably extend this list to 20, but the, the key insight here is that it's a finite set of changes you could possibly do to any set of practice that we're currently doing to change them. So what we do is we think about applying each of these patterns to a practice and see whether this would lead to an improvement or not. So the procedure is very simple. We capture what our existing practices are. We take our list of change patterns and apply them to understand or test the effects and then we decide to roll out the changes or we roll back the changes and decide not to do them. So let me go back to this example of our um, tourist attraction value chain model of the Empire State Building. Now I've run this exercise with executives and, and, and MBA students for 15 years now. And when I asked them, what is the first change that you would do to this value chain? I always get the first answer, always the same thing. We want to eliminate weight. So we take this practice and we apply the pattern eliminate. Which step can we eliminate, delete from the set of practices? Yeah, and of course, how? So what every student so far and every practitioner always answers is we want to get rid of the wait times. How might we do this? For example, instead of going to a ticket counter, we might just uh, book a ticket online. And we might just book a ticket, not just for any day, but for a particular time slot, say Tuesday, 10 a.m. So that by Tuesday, 10 a.m., when we go to the Empire State Building, we can go straight up. Yeah. So by applying this pattern of elimination, we can ask ourselves, um, what can we possibly eliminate? And of course, how might we do this? How might we implement this? Yeah. For example, through an online booking system. Um, for completeness, of course, you can also eliminate other steps. You can eliminate going up and going down again by, for example, having a webcam uh, installed that gives you a virtual experience of what you would see if you were up there. Yeah, and the, the upside is that you don't have to queue up, maybe you're afraid of heights and so forth. So the key point here is that you can not only eliminate wait times, of course. Let me give you different examples. Instead of eliminating, the opposite pair is inserting. So inserting a new practice, a new activity into our value chain. So for example, while we wait, we could offer opportunities to buy drinks and snacks and so forth at a bar, for example, uh, or through a, a waiter. That's supposed to be a waiter. You're running around serving drinks to people in the queue. 
um, right? So we can insert additional value adding activities into a practice, which is of course the opposite to um, elimination. Give you another idea of a change pattern, a resequencing. Resequencing is the idea that you take the practice that are in our value chain, but you order them differently. Yeah, so you do the same activities, but in different order. For example, what if we paid after we come back down from the Empire State Building? So number one, we can eliminate one of the waiting activities because we don't need to wait for pay anymore. And number two, what it would allow us to do is to offer different ways of payments. So at the moment, you pay a fixed sum to go up to the Empire State Building, and it doesn't matter how long you stay up there. But it makes a huge difference if you just quickly run up, take a picture of Central Park, or if you're waiting for that perfect moment to uh, propose to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, to your partner, etc. You might be up there for hours, which is a big issue because there's a limit of how many people can be up there on the Empire State Building. So if there's 20 people up there waiting for the perfect sunset and the perfect moment, um, other people cannot go up. So by delaying and resequencing payment to the very end of that value chain, we could do uh, things like dynamic payment, depending on how long you actually are at the viewing power platform. Um, another change pattern is integration. Integration means you take two separate steps and you combine them into one step. For example, enjoy and leave. Yeah, why do they have to be two separate activities where you stand up and enjoy the view and then you take the elevator down? An integrated activity might be bungee jumping from the top or, you know, a similar activity. This is obviously not entirely serious, but it illustrates the idea. Then again, another change pattern that we might apply is what we call specialization. Specialization means you take one element out of your value chain and you offer two different variants of it that are specialized in some sort of way. Yeah, again, an example. For example, going up, you could specialize and offer it in two variants, uh, in a main version and an express version where people pay extra to get there faster. Yeah, so if time is an issue, but you're very rich, you might be willing to pay a little bit more to uh, bypass a few queues and take an express elevators um, that takes you all the way up. That would be a specialization of the same activity. Yeah. So pay regular price, standing line, pay double the amount, go straight up. So as you can see here, these are a list of systematic change patterns, and they're always the same. You can eliminate, you can insert, you can resequence, you can specialize, you can make things optional, you can decouple, or you can integrate. And that's about it. That's all the different changes you could possibly do to a value model that you have. So by going through them systematically and thinking about what could we eliminate and how, where could we insert an activity and which one, you start generating a lot of solution-oriented ideas for your current models, depending, of course, which, which problems you have. Maybe you're not making enough money, maybe it costs too much money, maybe the quality isn't up there, and so forth. Now, that is enhancement. We're starting with current practices and a problem that we're having with them. And then we systematically, through pattern-based assessment, we start thinking of solutions for these problems. Now, let me show you a second approach, deriving better practices. It's similar, yet distinct, to enhancement. In enhancement, we look at in, we're looking inwards. In derivation, we're outward looking. We learn from the experiences of others. We learn what others are doing, um, analyze them, hopefully better practices, and then try to emulate them um, in our own value model. So we're looking essentially for solutions that others have found and see if these solutions elsewhere match a problem we're having. I'll give you an example for derivation. Um, the first industry sector that started triaging customers based on, on value add to the customers was the airline industry who started coming up with this idea of frequent flyer program in the 90s. The key idea here was to, to separate the status of customers sort of into A, B, and C customers based on how often they flew and how much money, obviously, they spent on flying. Yeah. So if you're a regular business traveler in business class, 
Um, that's a very different kettle of fish from being a person that once in a lifetime travels to America for a holiday, for example, right? So they started differentiating their value models for different types of customers. So if you're a frequent flyer, you have a separate check-in, um, you have a lounge, you get champagne on the flight and these sorts of benefits. Now, a, and a good example of derivation is how these ideas from frequent flyer were later in the 2000s adopted from the retail industry. Yeah, for example, here we have Qantas Freakin' Flyer, a major airline in Australia, and Woolworth Everyday Rewards, a major retailer in Australia. So they started adopting some of the things they saw in the airline industry and started thinking about, can we do the same, can we apply the same solutions to some problems we're having? For example, um, airlines were first to have self-service check-in counters, and you may know that by now many, many supermarkets have self-service checkout counters. Same idea. Um, apply to a different situation, a different problem, so to speak. So what we do in derivation is that we select the domain. We're looking outward. We need to figure out where we're looking and find the solution pattern that we see there. We apply it to a problem we're having with our own practices and sort of test or evaluate the effects and then again decide to roll out or roll back. I'll give you another example here which is uh, in the context of sustainable development um, in developing countries. Um, for example, the question, what could we possibly do with a blockchain, a novel type of distributed ledger technology? It doesn't really matter what they do. Um, it has a couple of features and it has been a play, um, applied in supply chain management for securing supply chains, for secure and trustworthy digital identities in, for example, in Estonia, um, for your uh, citizenship identity and national identity cards or in the medical industry for health records. Yeah, so it's a very secure database technology, so to speak. Yeah, and in sustainable development, Venezuela started thinking about, okay, what could we possibly do with blockchain technology to help with uh, public administration and governance? So they had a look at other sectors, the medical sector, supply chain sector, um, or uh, other types of governments, started seeing how they built solutions with blockchain technology, and then started deriving ideas how their own local government could deal with problems they were having. Voting in elections, for example, transparency and corruption, which is a, an issue in Venezuela, if you, if you read up a little bit on this country. So... They looked for solutions available elsewhere to apply them to problems they were facing. The key challenge in derivation is to find the domain where you look for solutions. And you can look for different types of sources. You can benchmark. You, that means you can find a competitor that in some level is, other, uh, is different from you. You can read up on case studies, uh, white papers, these sorts of uh, reports on very successful companies. You will find them, for example, in Harvard Business Review and other types of manager magazines. Uh, you can look at reference models, which are basically standards that exist for certain industries, like ITIL for the IT service management literature or um, SCORE for supply chain management and so forth. All of these are sources where you can find workable solutions that exist elsewhere. So again, let me illustrate this idea by going back to our Empire State Building example. If we are to look for innovative ideas through derivation, a guided question might be, how would another organization run the Empire State Building? What if it weren't us, but how would a different company that runs things differently, that has different practices, how would they run it? For example, ask yourself, how would Google run the Empire State Building? So we know that Google um, launches its products basically for free. You don't have to pay for Google Mail, uh, for the search engine, for Google Images, and so forth. But rather, it collects revenue through advertisement. That's what their practices are. That's what their solution is. So if we applied that to the Empire State Building, we could say, well, look, why don't we let people go up for free and enjoy the view, but we're selling advertising to them? Yeah. So our revenue model would change based on how Google would do it. I'll give you a second example. What if Virgin uh, would um, 
run the Empire State Building. Now, for those of you not familiar with such an Australian icon, this is Richard Branson, who's the founder of Virgin. And so yeah, Virgin Blue, Virgin Airlines, and so forth. And he's now into space travel. That's not relevant here. But if you think about what the practices are that Virgin Airlines institutionalized when they came about, how do they make money? And how they would that would apply to the Empire State Building. So one of the ideas what Virgin has been doing is dynamic pricing. So they were the first airline to basically sell you a seat on an airplane for a, a small amount of money and then charge extra for every other thing you want. Bottle of water, a bigger view, uh, a, a monitor so you can watch a movie, uh, crisps on the flight, etc. and so forth. So they also changed the pricing depending on how full the airplane was, whether it was holiday season, if the weather was good, etc. and so forth. Yeah. So at some stage, they even started charging for visits to the onboard toilet. Um, but they stopped that because there was a bit of an outcry that, you know, you shouldn't be charged money for having to go to, to the to the bathroom. But the idea here would be that if Richard Branson were to run the Empire State Building, you could have a dynamic pricing model that would ch charge depending on how many people are in the queue, whether the weather is good or uh, you know cloudy, um, how long you want to stay up there, if you want to have a camera to take a picture, and so forth. Yeah. So this was deriving ideas for how you run your practices from Richard Spence and the way of operating Virgin. Um, and third and final example here is if you have a look at how the Wall Street operates, how a stock market operates, you could think about, well, what could we possibly trade here with? So, for example, you could say, look, there's millions of visitors coming to the Empire State Building every every year um, and they spend a lot of time in the queue. So we might have some very interesting, very insightful, very experienced, very rich, otherwise very um value generating people in our crowd and we have access to their time so maybe we can trade access to people as a commodity on the stock market and the highest bidder can gain 10 minutes time with i don't know a senior executive that happens to be on the rooftop again no ideas too crazy these are just about coming up with different value ideas I will stop this video here because we covered half of the thinking styles and this video recording will continue with session two.